morning, everyone. It's 9.15, time for us to, to begin our adult Sunday school class. Welcome you uh, this morning. Hope you didn't get too wet. I'll tell you, when it rains in Florida, it rains, man. It's not drizzle, it's downpour. Wow, it's a heavy rain. At least it was at our house. Um, let's begin our time by seeking the Lord's help in prayer. Our Father, we are thankful for the rain that you give to us that waters the earth, and we know that we are utterly, completely dependent upon you for the rain and for the sun and for everything that is necessary uh, to sustain life upon this earth, that even in this past week, that it is by your providence that we have been kept and preserved. And we thank you that you have kept us who are your people, who are believing in Christ, that we come today uh, still believing in him. And we thank you, Father, that you have forgiven our sins for Christ's sake, that you have given him to us to be our Savior, the one who made propitiation for our sins. We thank you, Father, that he is always the same, yesterday, today, and forever, and that it is in him alone that our our trust is placed and our hope is built. And yet, at the same time, we are aware of our remaining corruptions and sins and how they cling to us, and we pray, Father, that as we have been delivered from the covenant of works and brought into your covenant of grace, that as our Heavenly Father, you would be merciful toward us, even in our remaining iniquities, and pardon them for Christ's sake. And we pray, Father, that you would grant to us the help of your Spirit as we seek to worship you today, as we study about church history, as we study your word later today. We, we pray for the sweet influences of your promised Holy Spirit to come upon us as your people. We pray for the Sunday school classes that meet, that you would help them, that you would meet with them that your word would be taught to our young people and children and that they would learn the truths of your holy word and that your spirit would work them deeply into their hearts and that they would bring forth lasting and eternal fruit. And so we commend these things to you and pray them in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> All right, uh, Pastor Nick is on vacation this week and so this was a a uh, week for me to pick up again with um, our um, study of church history. And so that's what we're going to do today. And let me just kind of review with you. It's been a long time. We've worked our way through. We're currently in this period, the Reformation Church period from 1517 to 1648. And really the way I'm, I'm addressing it is, is kind of in two segments. We might call the early Reformation and then the later Reformation period, because what I'm, do, I'm looking at the different major areas in Europe, in England, Scotland, leading up to really the establishment of the Reformation in those areas, and then breaking off, and then we're going to pick back up and look at what happened in the later period of the Reformation as we move into what's period is usually called the modern church. So, so far we've looked at the Reformation in Germany, the Reformation in German-speaking Switzerland, the Reformation in French-speaking Switzerland with the life and ministry of Calvin. Uh, these little radical groups that grew up during the Reformation, the Radical Reformation, we looked at those. Uh, the Reformation in England up to the Elizabethan settlement and uh, the Reformation in Scotland, which we just completed. Uh, so today what we're going to do is we're going to complete this survey of the Reformation in its early days, its establishment in different countries by looking at the Reformation in France and the Reformation in the Netherlands. So we're going to look at that today. Um, now we could also look at how the Reformation impacted uh, Scandinavian countries uh, like Denmark, Norway, Iceland, Sweden, Finland. The Reformation did, did break into those countries as well. But in order to not get too bogged down because there's so much that we could cover, I'm going to be a bit selective and finish our consideration of the initial outbreak of an establishment of the Reformation by focusing on these two areas which are perhaps uh, most important and most impactful in, in history in general. The Reformation in France and in the Netherlands, and again, as often is the case, I'm indebted and following closely with Nick Needham's treatment of these subjects in his, his uh, series of books on church history is one of those that I've drawn from a lot. So the Reformation in France is where we will begin. Okay? As we saw in our study of Calvin, 
uh, way back, uh, Protestantism first made inroads into France in the 1520s and 1530s. You may remember John Calvin was French, though he was in Switzerland. Geneva is in Switzerland. It was in the French-speaking part of Switzerland. You had a German-speaking part of Switzerland and a French-speaking part of Switzerland. So he still exercised a measure of influence in France through his writings and so forth. In fact, uh, as we're going to see, he had a huge influence. I'll talk about that in a few moments. But, but uh, so it began to make inroads into France in the 20s and 30s, but it also met with persecution. It was resisted by the French king, uh, who was Francis I in those early days. In fact, persecution was probably greater in France than in any other country where Protestants managed to establish themselves. Um, but in spite of the persecution, Protestants grew steadily in the 1540s and 1550s. And again, this was largely due to the influence of, of Calvin's ministry. Through Calvin's influence, French Protestantism became distinct, distinctly reformed uh, rather than Lutheran. And here's an interesting figure to give you some concrete idea of the influence that Calvin had and really the, the church in Geneva had. Between 1555... And 1562, that's a seven-year period, Geneva trained and supplied at least 88 pastors to French Reformed congregations. So you think about that. In other words, Geneva was sending out an average of 11 pastors trained in the academy in Virginia, Geneva, 11 pastors per year, pastor churches in France. And it's a great example of the, one in, the, the great impact that even one church can have uh, for the kingdom of God. And that was certainly the case with the church in Geneva. And Needham tells us that because of persecution for years, the French Reformed congregations had to meet in secret, in private houses, in the depths of the forests, or in remote country um, fields. And some congregations required their members to swear an oath never to reveal the names of the others. And pastors sometimes wore disguises. Can you imagine that? And they would assume false names. And if their identity became known in one place, then they would move to another place. And sometimes a Roman Catholic priest would embrace Reformed doctrine, but continue as a priest. And then gradually introduce these new views to the members of his flock. And so the Reformation continued to gradually spread even during these early times of persecution. But then next we'll consider, secondly, a turning point in favor of French Calvinism. And this came in the 1550s when a number of powerful French nobles began to favor the Reformed faith. Two in particular were very important. One was Prince Louis of Condé the acting head of a very powerful family in France, uh, the Bourbon family. And the other was Gaspard de Coligny. He was admiral of France. He was head of another very important family, the Chatillon family. Both men would eventually die for their faith. But by the 1550s, historians estimate that up, of, up to half the French nobility had become reformed. And then under the protection of these powerful and rich nobles and the areas and lands that they, that they owned, the French Reformed congregations in this period began to meet and to worship openly. In fact, in 1559, the Reformed uh, congregations her held their first national assembly in Paris, and they set up a nationwide organization for the French Reformed Church. And the way they organized it was basically... Uh, in a Presbyterian form, uh, similar to a Presbyterian form. At the local level, each congregation was governed by its pastors and elders. Above the congregation was a district assembly. Then above the district assembly was a provincial synod. And then at the top of that was a national synod. In 1559, the French Reformed Church adopted a confession of faith that had been actually drawn up by Calvin. Uh, it was revised some by the French church, and it's called the Gallican, or you think of Gaelic, uh, Gallican, or the French uh, Confession. It's usually, usually referred to as the Gallican uh, Confession. By 1561, Admiral 
Coligny estimated there were 2,150 Reformed congregations in France. In those areas where they formed the majority, the Reformed took over Roman Catholic Church buildings, and some of these Reformed congregations were huge. In fact, there was one in Rouen in northern France that had 10,000 members. They had four pastors and 27 elders. In their, they made a distinction between the two, so basically we would say they had 31 pastors, and it was a 10,000-member congregation. Now, think about that. And this reminds us, brothers and sisters, we have, by 1561, 2,150 Reformed congregations. Some were gigantic. This one with 10,000 members is an example of that. That this, the Reformation wasn't just some kind of political movement. It was a great awakening. It was a tremendous revival. Probably the greatest revival in history of the church occurred during the Reformation. These people were embracing the gospel. Now, there were a lot of pit political things going on in the higher-ups with your princes and your dukes and your kings and so forth, who, who were many of them, some of them were true Christians, but many of them were also just controlled by political concerns. But underneath that, what was happening in the ground level and the grassroots level was a tremendous awakening and revival. And this has happened over just a few years in France. It's a reminder of what God can do and what God has done in the past. It was also at this time that people started calling French Calvinists by a name that you may have heard of. Does anyone know the name? Is it on the board? Yes. Back up. <laughs> All right. Okay. The Huga, Huguenots was what we usually say, but apparently it should be pronounced, or it is pronounced Huguenots. The Huguenots. That's why I put that there for you. You got Huguenot, I guess would be the singular. Huguenots would be the plural, the way you would pronounce it. And uh, no one really knows for certain where that name came from. It, it, it su suggested it may have come from a German word that means confederates, and it was a way of speaking of kind of this, this commonality, this confederation of these reformed churches and people in, uh, in France, the Huguenots. Well, in when in 1559 the French king Henry II died, the French throne was greatly weakened at that time and had very little ability to persecute the church. His son Francis II was only 16. He was sickly. He died a year later. And then his brother Charles, Charles IX, became king, and he was only 10 years old. His Italian mother, the notorious Catherine de' Medici, ruled in his name, but at this time the real power in the land was in the hands of the great French nobles. And the nobles were divided into two factions. One faction, the Guise or Guise faction, was led by Duke Francis of Guise and his brother, the Cardinal of Lorraine. They were Roman Catholics, a very, very intolerant Roman Catholics. On the other side was the Bourbons, mentioned earlier, who were led by Louis de Conde and Admiral Coligny, both of which you remember were Huguenots. Well, this, this tense balance of power uh, prompted Catherine de Medici to issue a royal edict in January of 1562, and the edict granted a limited degree of, of official religious toleration to the Huguenots, uh, some were beginning to feel that it was just a matter of time before the whole of France would be Protestant. Uh, so it was a great time at that time, but that wasn't to happen. This hope was destroyed by the outbreak of religious civil war between Roman Catholics and Huguenots that tore France apart for the next 40 years. And this leads us now to consider, thirdly, the first period of civil war. And first of all, the incident that provoked it in 1562, uh, when Duke Francis of Guise, you remember the Guise family was Roman Catholic, uh, he was traveling to Paris, he attacked the Huguenot town of Vassy, and 63 Huguenots were killed. And this was followed by similar massacres in other places where Roman Catholics were in the majority. After the massacre in Vassy, Coligny was awakened one night by the weeping of his wife, Charlotte. And she said to her husband, Sir, I have on my heart and conscience all of our people's blood that has been shed. 
this blood and your wife cry to God in heaven and in this bed against you to warn you that you will be guilty of murdering those whom you do not prevent from being murdered. Now, it would be an interesting discussion and debate as to whether such counsel was truly biblical counsel uh, that he received from his wife. And we could talk about that. But as it happened, uh, being moved by these kinds of reasonings, the Huguenots, especially the nobility, decided it was their duty to take up arms. And this was the beginning of a long and bloody series of civil wars which almost completely destroyed France. The first three in succession occurred in 1562 to 63, then there's a little break, and then again 1567 to 68, then a little break, 1568 to 1570. And there were atrocities committed on both sides. But the greatest atrocity was yet to come from the side of Catherine de de Medici against the Protestants. And this leads us now fourthly, by the way, there she is, to uh, the Bartholomew Day's massacre. How many of you ever heard of that language, the massacre of St. Bartholomew's Day? Well, what was that? Well, in 1570, a temporary priest, uh, peace was made between the Huguenots and Roman Catholics. And it was during that time that the, the young king, you remember he became t- king when he was 10 years old, Charles IX, he had fallen almost completely under the influence of this great reformed leader, Admiral Coligny. Well, Charles's mother, Catherine, opposed Coligny because of the influence he held over her son, Charles, and she plotted his murder with the aid of Duke Henry of Guise, who wrongly charged Coligny with responsibility for the assassination of his, his uh, father, Francis, who was assassinated by uh, a Huguenot fanatic in 1563. Well, on August 1572... Huguenot and Roman Catholic nobles all flocked to Paris to witness the marriage of the Huguenot prince, Henry of Navarre. Now, this is a different Henry. We'll be hearing about a lot of Henrys as we go along. But uh, he, he was to marry the Roman Catholic princess, Margaret. That was Charles the Ninth's sister. And that marriage was meant to sig- signify a new religious peace in France because he, he was a Huguenot and she was a Roman Catholic. But four days after it, Coligny was shot by an assassin employed by Catherine. However, this assassination attempt failed, and Coligny survived, and as a result, Catherine panicked. And she was afraid that all of the Huguenots gathered in France at this time would take revenge, so she and the guys' nobility planned a general massacre of all Huguenots. And on the 24th of August, 1572, which was St. Bartholomew's Day in the church calendar, the massacre was carried out in Paris and in other major cities in France. Coligny and thousands of other Huguenots were slaughtered. In fact, the number of those that were killed, even given a very conservative estimate by historians, was somewhere in the area of 20,000 Huguenots who were murdered on St. Bartholomew's Day. The incident has gone down in history as the massacre of St. Bartholomew's Day. And the result was a renewed civil war between Roman Catholics and Huguenots. And this is where all of this gets complicated. As we consider now, fifthly, the renewal of civil war. The fourth, 1573. The fifth, 1574 to 76. The sixth, 1577. And the seventh, 1580, Huguenots wars. Uh, ran their destructive course throughout France without going into all of the details. Let me just mention some of the key figures. And I just remembered I forgot a book I, I meant to bring with me to show you. But because the first of these key figures was a man by name, the name of Philip Duplessis Mornay. Handsome fellow. Maybe that kind of beard will come back in style at some point. Um, he was a soldier and a diplomat. And of such brilliance that he was nicknamed the Huguenot Pope. And horrified by the St. Bartholomew's massacre, massacre, which he just barely escaped by the skin of his teeth, he wrote a political treatise entitled A Defense of Liberty Against Tyrants. And I had it sitting on my desk because I wanted to bring it to you to show it to you because you can buy it now. It's, public. it's, it's, uh, it's available today. 
And it was written under the pseudonym Stephen Junius Brutus. And scholars have differed over who the real author is uh, uh, with Mornay, another guy, Hubert um, Linguette, as the most likely candidates. Perhaps it was a collaboration between the two, but, but Needham takes the position that it was indeed Mornay who was the author of this book. And it's a book that sets forth and defends something that Calvin had already briefly stated in his Institutes, but it's set forth in great detail in the Margeberg Confession of 1550. And I have that too. I wanted to bring that and show it to you, and I forgot it. Uh, but what that's about is that in, in Lutheran Germany, there was a time when Charles tried to bring the Lutherans and Catholics together, and many of the Lutherans compromised on certain points in order to maintain peace. And the pastors of Magdeburg refused to do so, and so uh, Charles threatened them, and so they drew up this Magdeburg Confession, it, it, which, which argued that lesser magistrates have the responsibility to resist a higher magistrate if that higher magistrate is violating the law of the land or is violating the law of God and seeking to force people to do so. And so the, the city of Magdeburg held out against Char Charles. There was a large a siege there, and eventually Charles withdrew. And as a result, there was a great deal of religious liberty to practice the Lutheran faith that was maintained because of the stand that these pastors took in this particular city of Magdeburg took. And so they produced this, this detailed biblical argument for their actions. It's been called the Doctrine of the Lesser Magistrate. And it was entitled the Magdeburg Confession. Well, following in this same vein, Mornay argued that a king's authority was not unlimited. He was bound to observe the laws of God and his country. If a king trampled on these laws, he must be opposed and called to account. And here's an important point, though. This, however, this right of resistance, and this was the argument in the Magdeburg Confession as well, is not lodged in the people as private citizens. It's not just about individuals going out and trying to, you know, assassinate a ruler or something like that, but it's lodged in the lesser authorities who operate under the king. In those days, that would be the nobility, the gentry, the parliaments, the councils of the realm. In our day, it would be like the Congress, the Senate, Supreme Court, governors of states, and things of that nature. And they argued that they could use, and it was their duty to use, political means, resistance, and if it became necessary, even force to curb a tyrant's actions or to depose him. And this doctrine of the lesser magistrate would later have a profound effect in British history, and it also has a profound effect in American history because this was, uh, in this, this, this is part of the, the reasoning behind the American Revolutionary War, this, this, this idea. Some other key figures in this period were the three Henrys. I commented to Pastor Nick, I think, last week that uh, the history of the Reformation in, in, uh, in France could be much easier to follow uh, if the French had been a little bit more um, creative in their choices of names. It seems like everyone's named Henry. Uh, you remember Charles IX, who became king when he was a boy. He was later greatly influenced by Coligny, the Huguenot leader. Well, Charles died in 1574, and his brother Henry became king. 1570, he was king from 1574 to 1589. However, this first Henry was childless. And when his brother died, this meant that a second Henry... Henry of Navarre, we've mentioned him before, he was now heir to the throne. Well, Henry of Navarre was a leader of the Huguenots, and he was quite a general during the civil wars with the Roman Catholics. However, you have this first Henry still alive. His son has died. The one who's waiting in the wings, who is uh, the leader of the Huguenots, who's the heir to the throne, okay, that, that Henry... However, there was what was called the Catholic League. You know, in the, in the Civil Wars, it was the Catholic League against the Huguenots. And the Catholic League, the other side of the Civil Wars, was led by a third Henry, Henry of Guise. And he was already virtually, in effect, uh, ta had taken over the government of France, even though uh, Henry, the first Henry, was still the king. 
Well, this first Henry, Henry III, had Henry of Guise assassinated in 1588, but that failed to break the Catholic League's power over the government. And in 1589, this Henry, okay, who's, you got it, King Henry has no son, right? Waiting in the wings is Henry of Navarre, who's a Huguenot, who's heir to the throne. But then you have the Catholic League under Henry of Guise, and they're really controlling the country right now. Well, this first Henry had Henry of Guise assassinated in 1588. The Catholic League still maintained its power, and in 1589, this Henry III, who is king, okay, he was assassinated as well, this time by a fanatic Roman Catholic monk in revenge for Henry of Guise's death, and so who's left standing? It's the Huguenot, Henry of Navarre, the leader of the Huguenots. He's left standing as heir to the throne and the lawful king, and he's going to become Henry the fourth. And uh, after several years of war, 1590 to 92, uh, he managed to uh, establish his power across most of France, except mainly in Paris, which was still controlled by the Catholic League. So guess what Henry did? To win over the Roman Catholics in 1593, the great leader, political leader, mind you, okay, not spiritual leader, but in terms of the wars and the civil wars, of the great leader of the Huguenots, he abandoned Protestantism and joined the Church of Rome. It was totally pragmatic. And it just reminds you, don't trust politicians. Yes. <laughs> don't, tr don't be gullible. Christians can be so gullible when it comes to this. Yeah. Now, it's not to say there are some politicians, I believe, that are real believers, and we should hope the best. But often politicians will say whatever they need to say in order to get the power that they want to hold. And so Henry and Navarre switched over but there was good that came out of this, because you remember, he's fought all these battles for the Huguenots as a Huguenots general, partly just in self-interest, but he's done so. So the result of this was that the, the power of the Catholic League kind of melted away. More and more Roman Catholics declared their loyalty to Henry. And at the same time, to his credit, Henry was loyal to his, his Huguenot friends. And in April 1598, he issued the Edict of Nantes, or Nantes. And this edict, by the way, he was also a very immoral man. He was known for his, uh, his escapades with other people's wives and so forth. Another reminder, just because he was on the right side politically doesn't mean he was a, a godly man, right? Um, So uh, this Edict of Nantes, uh, it secured freedom of worship for Huguenots where it had existed in 1597 with the exception of Paris and uh, four other towns. And also Huguenots were admitted to public office. The children of Huguenots could not be forced any longer to receive Catholic training. It also allowed the Huguenots to hold four fortified cities within France, La Rochelle, Montauban, Cognac and La Charité, four cities, fortified cities. The Edict of Nantes has been viewed as a landmark in the history of religious liberty, at least a, you know, a large step in that direction. For the first time, one of the great historic Christian states in Europe had committed itself to the official acceptance of two faiths. As a result, uh, the Reformed Church in France entered into a kind of golden age of freedom and vitality, theological vitality. But just to tell you, it's not going to last for very long. Uh, things are going to get bad again when we get to six, around 1628, but that'll have to wait until we pick up later uh, with this period in our studies. But for now, there's kind of this 30-year period where things are good in France uh, for the Reformed Church. All right? Well, let's consider now briefly the Reformation in the Netherlands. Okay, now, now this is one we can spend a lot of time on, but I'm not going to, uh, oh, I didn't bring that up. There it is, the main points of the Edict of Nantes. Okay, the Reformation of the Netherlands. In the 1500s, the 16th century, the Netherlands was a group of 17 provinces. 
uh, whose economy and prosperity was based on trade manufacturing. And the inhabitants of the Netherlands were called what? I know what, what are the inhabitants of the Netherlands called? Dutch. Dutch, okay? Now, where did that come from? I was looking that up. You know, Deutsch is actually a word for Germans, okay? Um, uh, there's a place where my family's from called Dutch Cove. It was, relig- it was originally called Deutsch Cove. And so part of the, the origination of that is that uh, the Dutch people come from the same kind of stock of people going back way back hundreds of years as the Germans do. They're a Germanic people. It comes from an old English word that means people of a nation, something like that. And so that's, that's who they, t- they were called, the Dutch in, in the Netherlands. Now, in theory, the Netherlands was under the rule of the Habsburg family, which was represented in that period by King Philip II of Spain. So Spain really exercised great power and authority over the Netherlands uh, when the Reformation first was beginning. And King Philip was the son of the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. You remember him? He's the one that Luther stood before at the, at the Diet of Worms and said, here I stand, I can do no other. That was Charles V. And this was his son and Philip was also the most powerful and the most zealously intolerant Roman Catholic ruler in Europe. In spite of this, the Netherlands was exposed to strong Protestant influences really on every side. There was Lutheran Germany in the south, uh, Lutheran Scandinavia in the north, the French Reformed churches in the southwest, and English Protestantism in the northwest. And uh, so they were surrounded by Protestants, and the earliest Protestants in the Netherlands were Lutherans. In fact, the, uh, Europe's first Lutheran martyrs uh, were two Dutch Lutheran monks who had embraced uh, the gospel and were, were teaching uh, the doctrines of the faith, Lutheran doctrine, and they were, uh, I believe they were burned. I think they were burned at the stake. But in the 1550s, again, under the inspiration of Calvin's Geneva, the Reformed faith became the rising force in the Netherlands. And the leading preacher and organizer of the Dutch, organizer of the Dutch Reformed movement was a man by the name of Guy uh, de Bries, or Guido. Sometimes you may read his name in church as Guido de Bries, Guy de Bries. And... Uh, Through his personal study of the scriptures, he became persuaded of the Reformation gospel. He spent several years in Protestant England from 1548 to 1552 as part of a congregation of Dutch Reformed refugees who had fled uh, the Netherlands from persecution. But from 1552 to 61, he was back in the Netherlands. De Brie's most enduring accomplishment, perhaps, was the Belgic Confession of Faith, which is a beautiful confession of faith, which he wrote in 1561. He actually addressed it to King Philip of Spain as a defense of the Reformed faith. And uh, together with the later Heidelberg Catechism, which we're going through in Sunday evenings, and the Canons of Dort, it was to become one of what is called the Three Forms of Unity in the Dutch Reformed Church, which is really their doctrinal statement or standards. One of De Brees' greatest co-workers was a man named Peregrine de la Grange. And he was a very popular preacher. He was also very colorful and kind of had a dashing character. He would sometimes uh, gallop up on horseback into the forest glades where the Dutch Protestants would be gathered there to hear him preach. And And the way he would announce that the service was about to begin is he would fire off his pistols and it was time for worship to begin. By the 1560s, there were several Dutch Reformed congregations in the Netherlands. And again, this is amazing. This is uh, the gospel, uh, Protestant gospel, true gospel began to infiltrate the Netherlands in the 20s and 30s. By the 1560s, There were several large Dutch Reformed congregations in the Netherlands, including one of 15,000 in Antwerp and one of 20,000 in Tournai. 
Again, this is not political. This is a revival that was happening. The gospel was penetrating into the hearts of the people of the Netherlands, and they were embracing it, even, even in the face of persecution. And as it was with other countries we've studied, though Satan wasn't going to take this lying down, and Philip of Spain had no desire to tolerate this rapid growth of Protestantism in his domain. And from 1560 onward, Spanish persecution of Dutch Protestants became increasingly brutal. And the clash of convictions between the Roman, Catholic, Roman Catholicism and the Reformed faith finally ignited into one of the 16th century's most heroic conflicts, which if you want to read, you young people want to read something that's, that's exciting and interesting, you should read about uh, the, the, the Spanish-Dutch wars uh, during the Reformation that occurred in, in the Netherlands and all that happened during that time. 1566, violence erupted. Although no one was killed, Reformed congregations, though against the wishes of their pastors, went on a rampage uh, destroying Roman Catholic church buildings and images. Uh, Philip's patience snapped and he took harsh military action. Towns and cities were seized and occupied by Spanish troops. And in 1567, he sent his greatest general, Ferdinand Alvarez, the Duke of Alba, who was notorious uh, in, in Dutch history as a terrible guy. He, he came into the Netherlands to take charge of the operations, and he set out to do his work with shocking savagery, working through a special court, uh, which came to be known as the Council of Blood. And by 1571, the council had executed some 6,000 people. And this included Guy de Bries and Peregrine de la Grange, who were both hanged together in May of 1567. That guy looks pretty tough, doesn't he? And he was. That's a good painting, at least to capture what you read about him. Now, after this happened, the dangerous role of uh, leading the resistance against Spain fell to uh, what was one of the Reformation Europe's most brilliant soldiers and statesmen, Prince William of Orange, who is known as William the Silent. You ever heard of William the Silent? Well, this is the guy. He was called this because he was a man who he didn't run his mouth too much. He, he tended to keep quiet about his opinions and intentions, of course, until it was the right time, right? He, he played his cards close to his chest, Quoting from Needham, William was also one of the most personally attractive figures of our period, a man of immense humanity, whose single-minded devotion to liberating his country in a long and bloody war never hardened or narrowed his tolerant and sympathetic nature. Few leaders in history have inspired such affection from their people. The oppressed Netherlanders were soon referring to him as Father William. Initially a moderate Catholic, William embraced the Reformed faith in 1573. And it's very interesting, but I won't go into all the details of the war to free the Netherlands from Spain, but uh, it would take too much time, but I encourage you to read about it. It's interesting. But during the conflict, the Netherlands became divided into two separate nations. The northern reformed regions became an independent republic known as the United Provinces, or often called the Dutch Republic. In, in Holland was the most influential of those provinces. And then the Roman Catholic South remained under the rule of Spain in what is now present-day Belgium. As the war raged on, the Dutch Reformed Church became deeply rooted in the United Provinces. It was organized much like the French Reformed Church. You had local church pastors and elders, which were called the consistory, consistory regional synods, and then you had a national synod, its theological training center was the University of Leiden, founded by William the Silent in 1575. And uh, something that's very interesting about the United Provinces, it also proved to be an international center of religious toleration. In spite of the fact that the general view of the time was that heresy should be punished by the magistrate, uh, but this was not the case in the United Provinces, and this is largely because of the influence of William the Silent. William regularly told his reform supporters how abhorrent it would be if they persecuted others as Rome had persecuted them. 
And in William's Dutch Republic, Roman Catholics were given the legal right of residence and employment, uh, though they were still forbidden to worship, so it wasn't complete freedom, and they were, uh, they were forbidden to hold office. Now, before the war was won, William was assassinated in 1584. And Needham tells us that as the news of his death became known, we have it on good record that children wept in the streets over the loss of, quote, Father William. At that point, his son Maurice carried on the conflict against Spain. He was also a brilliant leader and general, and he succeeded in maintaining the freedom of the United Provinces against all Spanish attempts at reconquest. And finally, in 1607, the war-weary Spanish effectively recognized Dutch independence by suspending hostilities and in 1609 signing a truce with the Dutch. And the result was a new, prosperous, powerful, reformed nation, the Dutch Republic. And so that's how the Reformation was established in the Netherlands. Now, don't confuse this William of Orange with another William of Orange that's going to come later, of course, related to him. And he's going to be the one who's going to liberate England. And, uh, and establish what's called the Act of Toleration and the Glorious Revolution in 1689, which is the date of our Confession of Faith, which was actually published in 16, first written in 1677, but was published publicly in 1689 because it was in 1689 that Baptists finally had freedom to worship uh, in England. And uh, that was in part because of this relative of this William later, who was called William of Orange. And the uh, glorious revolution led by William and Mary against King James, and we'll get into that, but you can read about that. It's quite interesting.